Hello, beautiful people, and welcome, hi, to a pre-release analysis on the upcoming new character for patch 3.8. The, the kit is still very subject to change. Just keep that in mind, right? As usual with all the pre-releases, we're working with pre-release information, not release information. So it is possible that the character gets a buff or a nerf before they actually see life. But we are going to do the pre-release for Ayla. So she has 13,000 HP, a little bit over, 342 base attack, which is on the high side, 751 base defense, which is also somewhat on the high side for, um, for non-defense scalers, and crit damage ascension. People very often don't really care too much about the base stats, which is fair, but when it comes to on-field characters, it is always nice to have characters that have slightly higher base defensive stats, so you don't get one shot that often. Having uh, a relatively high base HP and relatively high base defense, these are kind of useful things, and as we're gonna see once we get a little bit later into the kit, this defense is also pretty helpful, and there's gonna be ways of scaling the defense within the kit that also give her a little, tiny, tiny little bit of added tankiness. But yeah, so let's get right into it. So first off, her normal attacks. Now, usually when it comes to normal attacks, they're not that important, but as we're gonna see later, she is a physical character. As a physical character, you're gonna build her for physical damage and therefore your normal attacks are actually gonna be a pretty reasonable portion of your output. So the actual scalings on them does matter. So let's actually compare it to other Claymore characters. So if we go take a look at the Luke, for example, who is another character that has pretty decently high scaling on his normal attacks, right? And you can see she's got pretty competitive, uh, arguably better numbers on the normal attacks of themselves. Now, the reason, main reason why Deluke is not a particularly good unit is because, while his normal attack numbers are actually fairly decent, his elemental skill numbers are uh. garbage. And, right, like, as you can see, it's ba basically the same numbers as the normal attacks, but the animations are pretty long. So when you're using your E, it means that you're not using your normal attacks. You have to do it three times. All in all, like because of the damage that you lose from not being in your normal attack animation while you E, it's just not like these numbers aren't enough to justify that. Ella doesn't have a skill that you have to spam all the time. So she's not gonna get like f***ed <laughs> over by that as much. So having pretty decent normal attack multipliers actually do matter. And as we're gonna see once we get to the ult, you actually do want a normal attack on her. It's part, part of the incentives in, in her kit include things that really favor normal attacks. Let's take, a, let's take a look at her E. Her E press slashes swiftly, dealing cryo damage. When it hits an opponent, she gains a stack of a Grim Heart that stacks up to two times. These stacks can only be gained once every 0.3 seconds. Now, what does Grim Heart do? It increases her resistance interruption, which is very nice, and her defense. So that's what I was talking, or, uh, that's what I was talking about earlier. The fact that she has decently high base defense paired with the defense bonus that she gains from this means that she's gonna be fairly safe while you're spending time on her on field. And as we're gonna see later, that's kind of necessary for a kit like hers. Her hold E, wielding her sword, she consumes all of her Grimheart stacks to deal AoE cryo damage. And then if if you do actually consume Grimheart, because you can use this even if you don't have any stacks, but if you use it while you do have stocks, uh, surrounding opponents will have their physical res and cryo res decreased, which are actually, you know, really nice little things. Each stock will be converted into an ice world brand that deals cryo damage to opponents. If you look at the damage numbers, the press is 249%, the hold is 418%. So if you were to build her for full, uh, full cryo damage, these would actually deal reasonable damage. But... The rest of the kit would be pretty shit, so that's probably not what we're gonna end up doing. And now finally, her ult, her, her burst, Glacial Illumination. Brandishes her greatsword, dealing cryo damage to nearby opponents and creating a lightfall sword that follows her around for a duration of up to seven seconds. While present, the lightfall sword increases her resistance to interruptions. So that's even more resistance to interruption. She's gonna be pretty hard to interrupt. When her own normal attacks, skills, and elemental bursts deal damage to opponents, they will charge the Lightfall Sword, which can gain an energy stack once every 0.1 second. Once its duration ends, the Lightfall Sword will descend and explode violently, dealing physical damage to nearby opponents. The damage scales on the number of energy stacks it has accumulated. If she leaves, leaves the field, the Lightfall Sword will explode immediately. Now, th th this might sound a little confusing, because, I mean, yeah, let's be honest, it kind of is. Uh, the wording on this isn't that great. It says maximum stacks 30, but you're never reaching 30 stacks unless, as we're gonna see later, unless you go for constellations. But at her baseline kit, you're never reaching 30 stacks. From what I've seen, and again, right, this is still pretty early into the beta, so there is not perfect 
combos available to us yet. The best combo I've seen was 12 stocks, but I, I, I do I do anticipate, because, you know, beta testers, not necessarily the most uh, theory crafting minded people. I, I do anticipate find, finding some combos that can maybe, maybe do 13 or 14 stacks at C0. So that's cool. Uh, anyway, if we actually calculate the damage, the base damage is 674.3%, which is a pretty high multiplier. And then for each stack, so let's say you do get up to, let's, let's use 13 for now. 13 times 137.8%. So you get a total scaling of almost 2,500. That's actually very large, right? And you, you, you might look at that and be like, wow, she's broken. Let's hold our horses for a second, yeah. Her energy cost is 80. Now, from what I've seen, her energy generation on elemental skill seems to be pretty low. I've seen one or two particles from the top. I think I've seen two or three particles from the hold. You really don't get that many skills in a rotation. So realistically, her energy requirements are either gonna be really high or you're gonna have to play her with battery focused units. Now, Cryo does have pretty good battery options, right? Cryo has Rosaria, Cryo has Diona if you play her, if you want her as your defensive option with uh, either Sackbow or Favbow. And so you probably, yeah, yeah, you also have Kea, although Kea's battery potential goes down a little bit if you're not playing him in a freeze team. And, well, she's a Claymore user, so it's gonna be pretty hard to play in a freeze team, right? Because she's just gonna shatter. Well, when you take that into, into consideration, this number isn't as high as it, as it seems, actually. And another thing that sh you should really keep in mind is that, I mean, this says seven seconds, right? So you'd think, okay, so she has to stay on field for seven seconds, right? It's more than that. Her ult animation is incredibly long. It's like a movie. And one thing that you're gonna notice if you go for her and you start playing her and, and all that, is that unless you're doing your rotations perfectly, your buffs start to run out before your lightful sword falls. So all of this damage is not getting your, I don't know, TTDS that you put on your team. And that ain't fun. I think a better way of conceptualizing what she does is instead of, of thinking about it as you know, she attacks for a while, dealing okay damage, and then at the end, the Lightful Sword falls down and deals a f ton of damage. Think of it this way. Every, every, like, additional attack that you're doing is adding 13, or, sorry, 137.8% to your ult damage. So it's kind of as if every single attack that you're doing is dealing an additional 137.8%, right? I think that's a slightly better way of conceptualizing it, and really realizing how good or bad she can be. Now, the, the basic, the, the, the biggest issue with something like this is her kit just doesn't lend itself very well to quick swap teams and, and just in general teams that have multiple different sources of damage. And the main reason for that is because she's gonna have high field times and she's mainly focused on physical damage. Now, the problem with that is that we just don't have the kind of supports that can take advantage of physical damage buffs. We don't have an off-field Fischl that can deal Fischl levels of damage for physical damage that could take advantage of physical damage buffs. And then on top of that, the physical damage buffers that we have are kind of not very good, right? So I'm sure, I'm sure you're seeing this kid and you're like, wow, we finally have a unit for Mika. What kind of dumb idea was it to release Mika when there was no actual real physical carry. Why release this unit after Mika instead of before? That, that's such a stupid thing to do. And yeah, kind like in a way, kinda, but also Mika's kit just doesn't work that well with her. Because here's the thing, Mika's energy generation, not the greatest. And if you actually look at the numbers that you get from Mika, the, the amount of buff that you're getting, it's barely enough to give more damage to your team than using a support character like Rosaria would do, right? Like, because Mika doesn't do any damage himself, the damage you're losing from not having a different unit in Mika's slot is not really made up by the fact that you're actually using, you're actually getting Mika's buffs on your on your carry, right? On on your on your Ella. Really, like, ugh. And then you, you you look into it more and you realize if you don't have this C6 for crit damage, it's just not very good. Like Mika's kind of just a downgrade to the team. But then if you do have the C6 for crit damage, then, well, realistically, right? People that get C6 or of a, of, a, of a four star on a banner like this generally end up with a few constellations for the five star, 
because it takes a while. And the people that are would be interested in getting Mika to C6 on this banner are generally gonna be people that are planning on going High Constellation for her, right? But here's the thing, with her C6, which we're gonna look at in more detail later on, you start with five stacks instead of zero, and every time you attack, you have a 50% chance to gain two instead of one. But what's actually gonna end up happening is you're gonna build up your Lightfall Sword to so much damage that it's gonna way overkill the enemy, so you're gonna wanna swap early. And here's the thing about Mika. This buff, this physical damage buff, and this C6 crit damage buff, all right, they don't snapshot. And not only do they not snapshot, but they don't actually have a duration. They're only active when your character is active, and as soon as you swap out, they're gone. The only way to detonate Ella's sword early is to swap out of her, which means that if you want to take advantage of this without having to, like, overkill the enemies, at which point, you know, you didn't <laughs> need the, this anyways, and you swap out early, the buff's gone, and you don't get it for your ult. Which means that for Logan Ella, Mika sucks because you don't have this, and for Hycon, Ella? Mika sucks because you can't take advantage of this. So, I, I understand, you know, if, for, 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 the, for the Mika enjoyers out there, that you might, you might be looking at this and being like, wow, finally my Mika is gonna be good. No. Your Mika is gonna feel kinda shit, and it will not be optimal, but it will be playable, right? And Mika basically, with this unit, goes from biggest meme to just a pretty bad unit. He might actually reach Shinyan level, you know? Which is cool, I guess. Anyways, let's look at the passes real quick. If two stacks of Grimheart are consumed, a Shattered Lightfall Sword will be created that will explode immediately, dealing 50% of the basic physical damage dealt by Lightfall Sword. So, the basic one, so it's, it's only the base damage, not with, so with no stacks. But you basically get a 300-something motion value physical hit in AoE when you hold your E if you have two stacks. Which is nice, you know, it's useful. When Glacial Illumination, which is the ult, is cast, the cooldown of your skill is reset and you gain, and it uh, gains one stack of Grimheart. So basically what that means is if you EQ, um, you'll be at two stacks of Grimheart with your E being available, so you'll be able to hold E. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. This is gonna be a little bit of a Dea situation. You know, with Dea, one of the biggest issues that I had in her pre-release was that she wasn't really that great at anything, which meant that if I wanted to be talking about all the ways that you can play her, I'd have to mention every single thing. Because, like, it's not like she ha she's that great at any role, so she's not much worse at a role she's not designed to do than she is at a role she is designed to do, just because she's- Wreck and ruin! Right? With Ella, it's not to the same extent, but the, the same idea is here where, realistically, her best teams won't be the teams she's quote-unquote designed for. Honestly, her numbers just don't really justify it. When you look at the actual, like, damage that she can do in a rotation, if you actually buff her up, it's fairly reasonable. But the problem is the units that you use to buff her up don't do any damage themselves. And if you start looking at putting unit that, units that do damage themselves instead, then other carries would perform better overall with them. Let's look at the constellations before that really quickly. Constellation 1, Tidal Illusion. Every time the Grim, Grim Heart stacks are consumed when you hold your E, her physical damage is increased by 30%. Each stack consumed will increase the duration of this effect by 6 seconds, up to a maximum of 18 seconds. Basically, you get, you get 30% physical damage. It's whatever, you know, cool, I guess. C2, decrease the cooldown of her E hold making it the same as the E press. This is useful when you're just doing overworld stuff. In actual combat, it doesn't matter that much because even with this, you can't really get two hold E's with full stacks within an ult window. And you don't really want to be spending too much time on her outside of the ult window. In overworld, it's pretty useful. It, it makes, you know, non-ult stuff less painful, which is cool. Constellation 3, Lawrence Pedigree. Increase the level of her ult by three. This is actually a fairly reasonable constellation because the brunt of her damage is coming from her ult. That being said, a very reasonable portion of her damage is also coming from her normal attacks, which means this isn't the same kind, the same like level of increase as you get from something like I get Shanling's burst, right? Basically, all of Shanling's damage is coming from her burst. So her burst level constellation does a lot for her personal damage. This doesn't do quite as much because you have a decent portion of your damage that's coming from normal attacks, but it is still an okay-ish constellation. C4, 
Uh, Lifeful Swords deal 25% increased damage against opponents with less than 50% HP. This is kind of bad because realistically, if your setup before your ult go like falls dealt enough damage to put the opponent below 50% HP, you're probably killing them with your ult even without this effect. So it's only really useful if the enemy is really tanky and you're taking multiple rotations to kill them. But at that point, if you're at C, like no one, no one goes to C4 without intending to go to C6, especially on a character that doesn't have the greatest C4. And if you actually do get up to C6, that won't happen. <laughs> her Constellation 5 increases her E level. It's pretty bad. And then her Constellation 6 that I've already talked about earlier, it basically just gives you more stacks and it gives you a decent amount of stacks when you cast it. This is a pretty good constellation. It's a C6 that actually does C6 things. And yeah, like it's just, it, it, it's, it's a fairly good one. Oh yeah, and actually the most important part of her kit, I almost forgot, I can't believe I almost forgot, I'm so sorry. When she crafts character talent material, she has a 10% chance to receive double the product. Sing so does like the possible refund one, right? And this is generally slightly better. Anyways, let's do the usual weapons. And let's start with the claymores, right? So let's go take a look at weapons and see what we're working with. Her signature weapon is pretty good on her. It's generally gonna be, the, gonna be the best in slot, but it's not actually that far ahead of the other good options if you start stacking a bunch of attack buffs. Because part of the value in this weapon is that it has very high base attack and attack percent as passive. So the, the weapons that give crit, right? And that don't give a lot of attack, maybe not bacon so much so, um, but they're, they're not that far behind when you're looking at slaying her with Bennett, for example. So, Red Alert is generally gonna be, I mean, Bacon just gives a lot of stats. Good, five star. Red Horn also good, five star. Realistically, right, the main difference between these two is one gives crit damage, the other gives crit rate. So whichever suits your ratio better will uh, generally just be better. Uh, Unforge is actually reasonably good. It's also a pretty, maybe I'll say decent instead of good because I wouldn't put it quite on the same level as the others. But if you if you don't have any attack buffs and you actually do use a shield, it is actually a very competitive option. Wolves is also potentially pretty good, but it does lose a little bit of value from the fact that, I mean, the, for the same reason that the Constellation 4 isn't all that great, which is that once the enemies are low, usually you're like getting a your ult to do more damage is just gonna go make you from overkilling the enemy a little to overkilling the enemy a lot which won't matter too much so you you, you often won't be able to take full advantage of the wolf's passive uh skyward is actually also a fairly reasonable five star option because in a lot of the teams that we're gonna be looking at her her ear requirements are they're not too high but they're high enough that the ER from Skyward isn't wasted. And the passive from Skyward is also surprisingly decent on her. First off, it doesn't say it here, but this is physical damage and scales with physical damage percent, which is, you know, pretty Frost. significant. But also, this kind of helps her front load a little bit more of her damage before the ult goes through, which when you're fighting multi-wave content, for example, does help you potentially kill the first wave so that your ult like before your old hits, so that your old hits on the second wave. So there can be some added value there. As we're gonna talk about a little bit later, you can also play around with her crit ratios to kind of cheat out more damage or avoid annoyances. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, but this makes more of your damage not be from the single hit at the end, which reduces variance in terms of crit RNG. Uh, Akumaru is okay. Joel is okay. Snow Tombed is okay. Serpent's Spine is generally gonna be her best four star option because, well, it's Serpent's Spine. <laughs> Archaic is okay. That is, is interesting because it is actually a very good option in her best teams. But as we're gonna look at later, her best teams are not the teams where you play her as a physical carry. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. Realistically, once you start getting to the, trying to get to floor 12, if you're not like very, very over invested, melee teams will be pretty hard to to play and to, to get through with how how much more difficult Abyss has been getting recently. And if you just really want to play her and you're struggling with her teams, then you can try putting her in a hyper bloom core 
or even a reverse melt core. And in those teams, you would use Fav. It's generally not going to be the weapon that you go for on her main build, but it's still nice to have leveled if you do want to play her there. But I'm not actually going to say that it's like her best weapon. And then Skyrider Greatsword is surprisingly okay. The Skyrider Greatsword passive is actually insane, right? On hit, normal in charge attack, increase attack by, well, this is R1. 10% for 6 seconds, max 4 stacks. So you gain 40% attack from this. That's a lot from a weapon passive, right? Like, that, that is a very large amount. And because of that, even though it's a 3-star weapon with pretty bad base stats, it is actually somewhat competitive with her other good 4-star free-to-play options. It's not great, but it is surprisingly okay. You know, if you if you missed the event for a luxurious sea lord, you haven't explored dragon spine, and you don't want to waste a prototype, you can pretty reasonably use this. It is also less expensive to level than the four star options, which is nice. Okay, let's move on to the artifact sets. Really quickly, the the, the main one is gonna be Pale Flame, right? Like that, that that's her main artifact set. Is four piece pale flame that's her best in slot that being said it is actually not that far ahead of some of the other options and it's in a domain that a lot of people don't want to farm because there's not that many teams anymore that care too much about getting tenacity for a lot of people they don't have anything to do with the other artifacts that in the domain so they don't like spending their resin there which I understand. I'd say if you don't want to go for a four-piece spell flame, that's completely fine. You know, another upside from that is that if you're going for the other options, a lot of them are just two-piece, two-piece options, and they might be artifacts that you already have and that are already leveled, right? So for example, Glad, two-piece, two-piece with attack or physical damage, or even Noblesse, right? Is not too far behind. Now, obviously you don't want Noblesse over a physical damage set or an attack set, but if you don't have one, that's not the end of the world. So that covers Bloodstained as well. You don't want to go for a piece of Bloodstained. Chimanawa, four piece is not good because you don't want to make your burst cost more expensive. It's already <laughs> expensive enough. Like it's, it's a very bad idea and it doesn't buff your burst damage. It only buffs your normal attack damage. So just don't use it. Emblem is actually surprisingly decent. Well, maybe not surprisingly. She is a an energy hungry character, but it is not better than Pale Flame for two reasons. Well, her energy requirements are not that high, so you're not getting that much damage from the from the four piece. But also just the amount of stats that you gain from Pale Flame is a lot. For the elements, it's 15%, right? 15% on the Dendro set, 15% on the Electro set, all that. For the physical sets, it's 25. And Emblem also gives you damage percent, which is additive with this. So basically, comparatively, you just gain a lot more from the physical sets. You also gain more from a physical goblet than a an elemental goblet, but uh, yeah. So all in all, 4 piece Emblem, fine. It's all right if you have a really good one and you don't want to bother farming a new set. But it's not the main thing I'd recommend. Blizzard Strayer, unfortunately, because she's a Claymore user, she will shatter frozen enemies. So you can't take advantage of the full four piece passive. You can use it just with the like on enemies affected by cryo part of it for 20% crit rate, but it's not really enough to justify using it. I would say don't in general. It's not a great idea. And finally, four piece Lava Walker. Well, if you're playing her in, in a Rev Melt core, it's fine it's all right it's not generally the, the main thing you'll be you'll be wanting also we've got the four piece instructor if you're looking for single target damage you want to play her in a hyperloom team four piece instructor is going to be pretty useful i guess it will make you squishier but i'm so sorry but the good <laughs> Let's take a look at the artifact stats now. The main thing that you're gonna be going for is attack, physical, crit. You can consider ER slash physical crit, but it's not as good because most of the time her ER requirements shouldn't reach high enough that ER send would be necessary. You could make an argument for cryo if you're playing her in a quick swap melt team, but there's just better units for that, so I wouldn't really recommend it. Generally, like th this is the main thing you're going for. And then finally, we gotta talk about her teams. Let's start with her baseline stuff, like uh, as a hyper, whatever. Right, you can use Mika or other buffers like Bennett, stuff like that, whatever, cool. It's just not gonna be the greatest team. It's, the, what it's competing with is generally just stronger than, than it, and it's just not that good. But if you want your ult to do big numbers, that's the thing to go for. I mean, you can use her with Raiden, which is which could also be considered a hyper, but like not really. Those teams are also fine, but would be better without her. Why you just replace her for another buffer for Raiden and it just does better. But if you really want to play her there, it's still like, it's still a reasonable team that can clear things. So you can actually play her without Superconduct if you're using Shenha, so, and uh, with like a, kind of a mix between Mono Cryo 
and physical. Also pretty good, just because you're getting the additional physical shred from Shenha and a decent amount of additional damage for cryo damage both on Ella and on whatever other cryo unit you're using like Rosaria. But th this is also a fairly reasonably good team. And then you start getting into the other stuff. So you've got Reverse Mel, for example. Others are better, but it works. You've got Hyper Bloom, same thing. But yeah, her, her, her main issue basically stemmed from the fact that her damage is just not high enough to justify the, the, the bunch of like, I don't know how to put this properly. When a character has flaws, it doesn't mean that like they're a design flaw. It just means that like there is a downside to their kit. Well-balanced characters have downsides that are balanced by their upsides. Her upsides aren't high enough to justify how crippling her downsides are. Some of those downsides include the fact that her damage is, a lot of her damage is in one hit, which if it doesn't crit, you're gonna have to reset if you're not like way over geared for the content. If it misses, you're gonna have to reset. And from the footage that I've seen, on some enemies, that's not really a problem, but on mobile enemies like Wobber Flowers, for example, it seems to miss pretty fucking often. You can remedy that by just swapping out early to detonate it manually, but that's gonna make it do less damage, right? Which is still a downside. That being said though, she does have some upsides. So let, let's, before, before we, you know, conclude our pre-release, let's go through some of the ways that you can use a kit like hers to kind of cheat out some more damage. So let's quickly talk about the crit ratio. People very often talk about the one to two crit ratio as being the optimal crit ratio. In the, in, as, a, as a general rule, it is, right? If you're critting 50% of the time and you have 100% crit damage, that means that 50% of the time you're gonna do your baseline damage, let's say one, and 50% of the time you're gonna gain 100% more damage on that, so it's gonna do two. So your average damage is gonna be 1.5. If you change this to 40%, right, you lose 10% crit rate. Each source of crit rate or crit damage would give you twice as much crit damage as it gives you crit rate. So if you lose 10% crit rate, you, sh you should be able to gain 20% crit damage in exchange, which is a little bit less than 1.5. So the further you get from this 1.5 ratio, the less average damage you get. The thing is, average damage is useful, but it's not necessarily going to be the only metric that matters. If you're only getting one hit in your rotation, if you're willing to reset when you don't crit, th this, this is 0%, it never happens because you just reset if it does, and then you're gaining a lot of damage. You're going from 1.5 to 2.2. And then you can potentially, if you're willing to reset a lot, get even higher and higher and higher. In reality, she doesn't just do one hit. She does a bunch of hits followed by one big hit. And what it basically ends up being is if you are actually willing to reset every time that you don't crit, it changes the optimal crit ratio from one to two to somewhere closer to one to five, actually. Uh, if you start go get going one to six, one to seven, the damage that you're gaining from your ult at the end isn't as much as the damage that you're losing from all of the normal attacks that are not critting before the ult. Even if you reset every time your ult doesn't crit, you are actually losing damage if you go if you go to too much higher than one to five. So if you are willing to reset, you can cheat out a lot more damage by going to a little bit more scuffed of a crit ratio. That being said, that upside, that way that you can cheat out more damage comes with the corollary downside. If you don't want to reset, you're going to hate your life. You might actually want to go to a one-to-one yeah. -one ratio just so that you never don't crit. You always crit, right? If, if resetting is something that frustrates you, you might a actually find yourself not necessarily forced, but almost to go to a ratio that favors crit rate a bit more, which will hurt your average damage. That being said though, this is one upside that she has. She's not the only unit that has that upside. You can use a similar strategy on units like Raiden that has a pretty big hit at the start of her rotation. And it being at the start of the rotation means that when you have to reset, you'll know earlier, which is nice. You can use it on units like Child in international teams that gets his nuke at the beginning of, his, of the rotation. Point being, this is not a mechanic that's unique to her but it is one way that you can potentially cheat out more damage and unlike those other units you're gonna find yourself in situations where you might need to do that to reach the dps requirements for your chamber a little bit more often if you actually do look at high constellation gaming right you're a whale and you can actually 
you know, take advantage of constellations. You can use your ult and then immediately swamp out. And when you're dealing with multi-wave content, having multiple nukes on your team can make it so that you can, well, if you're a whale, you can actually do enough, get so much, so many stats on your characters that you one-shot things even without having to set up with supports, right? And if you do reach that amount of investment, then you, oh, you use your ult and then you swap to someone else who has a nuke and you can nuke a bunch of different waves. So there is some value to be found for, uh, with her at like whale level speed running. That being said, she's also far from being the best unit for whale level speed running, right? You've got other units that don't have animations that are quite as long as hers and don't need the sixth constellation to be able to actually do this. It's another thing going for her, but it's not like all that great. I do think that does it for the, and the pre-release. I hope you guys learned a thing or two, enjoyed your stay. If you're looking forward to her, obviously, like don't don't let anything in this video convince you not to pull for a unit that you like. Meta is cool and it's and it's it can be nice, it can be important and all that. But some people just don't care about it that much. It's it's good to know how good a unit is before you wish on them so that you know what you're getting into. Then uh, who who am I to stop you, right? I'm being a little harsh, but the point is here: not everyone cares too much about min maxing for Abyss. And if you're willing to go for a character that's not the greatest because you like their personality, you like their voice lines, you like their animations, I don't know. Well, for whatever reason, don't let them not being the greatest be the thing that stops you. If you if you don't actually care that much about how good they are, but uh, yeah. So I think that's gonna be it. Uh, thank you guys for watching. I hope you learned a thing or two, and I'll see you guys in the next one. See ya. I need Primorse for my Eula.